Hi, folks. We'll begin in just a moment. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's LF networking webinar. Our topic for today is NFE deployments and the path ahead, an operator's perspective. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, all of our attendees will be muted during the presentation. However, if you'd like to ask a question or if you have a comment for the group, uh, there is a chat and Q&A function towards the bottom right of your screen. Uh, so feel free to type in any questions or comments you may have throughout the duration of the event. Uh, we will have some time towards the end to uh, do some live Q&A. And if you do have questions, uh, we'll be pulling questions from uh, the Q&A window at that time. Uh, recording of the of today's session will be available uh, beginning tomorrow, and anyone who's registered for the event will receive that link via email, and we'll also be sharing it on social media and the LF Networking website. All right, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists now. If we could kick it off to our first slide. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, so today we have joining us uh, Lee Wang from China Mobile. We have Beth Cohen with Verizon and Randy Levensaller with Cable Labs. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off to Beth to get us started today. So thank you, Jill. Uh, so I'm very excited to be uh, uh, joining us with along with Randy and Lee, and uh, we're gonna be talking about a white paper, or actually it turns out to be two white papers that we wrote specifically around the topic of testing and automation and the support for uh, virtual network functions or NFEs. Uh, so with that, or VNFs, sorry, virtual network functions. Um, so <clears throat> with that, I would like to, <clears throat> like to start um, a little bit of an introduction. So I'm Beth Cohen, I, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I, I work for Verizon as a product manager and am heavily involved in um, deploying software-defined networking solutions for our customers. And uh, with that, Randy, just a quick introduction. Yep. Randy Levensaller, I'm a principal architect at Cable Labs. Um, we're working on kind of creating standards and specifications for deploying network virtualization in the cable space. And Lee? <laughs> Um, hello, I'm Lei Hua from China Mobile, and I'm a re researcher in China Mobile uh, Research Institute, and I am uh, focusing in the NFE testing and some other field, and also um, include the industry field, and I'm now the chair of EOAG. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so with that, actually, Lee, that's an excellent segue into, you mentioned, the EUAG. And um, I'd like to, you know, have you talk a little bit about <clears throat> what's the role of the EUAG within the LFN uh, Linux Foundation networking um, portfolio? Oh, yeah, it's a very good question. Um, as you know that uh, the EUAG is uh, uh, the end user advisory group in LFN. Um, and it is composed of various end users. Many of them are operators. We analyze and discuss the latest industry trends, uh, collect operator requirements, and put forward operator industry recommendations. Um, so as to promote the development of various open source communities and standard organizations in the industry. Um, through the EOAG, the requirements of operators can help promote the development of the industry and the technology of the industry can also be discussed and used by operators in turn. Thank you. So Randy, you're not an operator or your, your company's not an operator. How, how do you see as a benefit of, uh, of EUAG? Yeah, so you know, we really work on behalf of the cable operators since we're a nonprofit wholly owned by them. And for this, it's really a way where we can kind of get together 
with people in other related industries and really we can represent the views and collect feedback for all of our members. So we find that the end user advisory group is a great place to get together and we get a lot of great readouts. And then with um, papers like this, we can really help identify, you know, what are some of the opportunities and also, you know, dig into some of the gaps of where we think we can improve um, what LFN is doing. So it's really a, a great place to go and, you know, a free exchange of ideas. So it's just, you know, a lot of great stuff going on. <laughs> well, thank you. And and for, for me, um, you know, I'm I'm talking from as Verizon, Verizon is is um, you know, we we participate in the development of ONAP and Anakit and some of the other projects. And um, I, you know, from my perspective, I see the EUAG as, as sort of pulling together all those requirements and um, feeding them back out to the projects. So, you know, that's that's that feedback loop that's so important. And, and I know the EUAG started as a, the advisory group to ONAP, but of course it's expanded its role, which segues into the next topic, which is um, how do you see the, the VNF testing that we discussed in the white paper uh, fit in with the, with the role? So yeah, I think that you know this is really kind of one of these ways where we can help provide feedback to multiple projects. And we've had projects over the years, even you know, pre-LFN through the through ONAP with that end user advisory group about, you know, what is the importance of testing, what certifications do we need, and how can we really help ease this this adoption, right? Because that's one of the big challenges with open source and these newer technologies is we really need a repeatable, confident way to have these products from perhaps a very wide variety of vendors that can then be you know, quickly brought into an operator network and run at scale. And in order to do that, we really need a lot of automated testing and checks to make sure that everything works. And also with virtualization, right? one of our big benefits with virtualization cloud native is this agile process. So we'll actually be having lots of releases. So it's not like you can go and qualify a piece of hardware for six months and then go drop it in the field and it'll run with just a few minor updates for five or 10 years you're going to be rolling out new updates you know, multiple times a year, maybe even multiple times a month. And there's no way to really do that without automation and around the test, the testing cycle. And the more kind of open source engagement there is, um, the better foundation that everyone can, can go from. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Lee, you're, you're. Uh... Um, yeah. Um, I totally agree with Randy's opinion. And from my perspective, I would say that, um, as you know, that in the early period, um, the EOAG have organized a survey for um, NFE automated testing. And uh, um, this survey has been supported by many of our um, EOAG CSPs members. And from the survey, we have um, analyzed and investigated many requirements uh, from from that, we have um, tried to put forward some uh, recommendations um, in terms of NFV automated testing, and uh, um, try to um, summarize and uh, collect uh, most of the recommendations from our CSPs members. And from um, uh, and from the white paper, you can try to read and find out these. Um, requirements and recommendations for reference. So that actually brings up a good point, which is that, um, you know, things are changing very rapidly. And I know we talk about that in the paper and, and, and I think we'll talk about it more in a, in a minute, uh, which is that, you know, traditionally telco operators, you know, as Randy said, put um, hardware out in the field and expect it to, to perform untouched. Uh, you know, for 10 or 15 years. Um, and that's just not reality anymore. I mean, you know, we know that the gaming operators literally change, but, you know, they, they, they do code updates literally hourly or minutes, you know, within minutes. Now, yeah, it's only three lines of code that they change, but still that that's a whole different mindset. Um, so I want to, with, with that, I'd like to, um, you know, have um, Lee, if you could talk a little bit about, 
you know, what, what your findings about what the current state of testing uh, is in the operator and the open source communities. Um, and, uh, you know, here's a, the diagram of the testing framework. And if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, um, indeed, from this framework, um, it is one of uh, one of the parts of our white paper. Uh, we we have tried to um, analyze and investigate the um, popular testing framework in different SDOs. The it's the testing framework is one of them. Um, as you can see from this graph, uh, they have put forward a DevOps process. Um, uh, and we have a VNet provider, a VNet package repository, and uh, um, we, we can uh, use the DevOps server to collect the, um, the testing requirements from VNet provider. And after that, it, it do the data handle and, uh, and also send the testing, um, uh, testing process to the test framework. And, uh, and, and this is ju just the, the um, standard framework. And based on the standard framework, we try to do some uh, realization and implementation in different um, industry open source communities. And as you know that we have such as VTP, x et cetera, they, um, they are, the, most of them are based on this framework. So, um, so that's that's interesting that you say that. So you found that um, Etsy, the Etsy framework was was probably the common denominator. Um, you know what other what other um, organizations were involved? And and I throw this out to either Lee or Randy to to talk about um, in terms of you know testing testing frameworks. I, I know that Anakit has a Funk Test, for example, um, which is focused on the infrastructure. Um, but I know that there are others as well. Yeah, I think, you know, ONAP has some testing as well within it for looking at some of the network services and how they're composed. Um, you know, MEC is another thing because we find that EDGE and NFE are very closely related. Um, so a lot of the tools that we build for one tend to apply to the other and vice versa, since it's, you know, all things that are related to the position on the network and you need very consistent performance and a lot of those things. So we're really kind of seeing a lot of overlap between those. Um, and then you know, even just looking at a lot of the standards for the applications we're deploying, you know, things like 3GPP and ORAN, um, and we're starting to see more test tools come out in those spaces. Um, and similar to what we're doing in the cable space as well. Would you say, and, and I'm and I'm looking at a question that somebody posed. Would would um, would either of you say that the state of the current testing tool sets is not well integrated? Um, and that's I think that's one of the recommendations that we made in the white paper. Take that, Lee. I can. Yeah. So yeah, I think so. I think there's you know. There are certain functions that you can only test with a proprietary test tool today um, due to licensing and IP arrangements. Um, I know a lot of work is going on in that space to allow those licenses to be modified or have a one-off license to do additional um, testing tools in open source. And the other is, you know, there's tends to be tests that focus on the infrastructure like we do with OPNFE. And then ONAP tends to focus on the application, okay. which is why having Ennicut come together to really try to bridge those um, really shows kind of where we're moving. But yeah, right now it's typically, you know, most operators end up writing their own test suites because a lot of it's very dependent on their network as well. So we're really hoping to kind of get a flexible framework to do this. You know, a lot of the piece parts are there. Um, there's a few gaps here and there that are either filled in by, you know, someone wrote an Ansible script or, um, you went with a private vendor, um, but this is where, you know, some of these things we've tried to call out in the white paper to really try to bring this together and make it a much more seamless um, process and more consistency across the different levels of the network. And, and Lee, could you comment about, um, you know, what were the key takeaways that you feel that are, that we should highlight in this, uh, in this talk from the paper? You know, what, what did you learn as you went through the process of, of writing it? 
Um, indeed, as you know that um, the, the NFV testing white paper will be divided into two papers, um, which cover the analysis of operators automated testing status, um, gaps, technical requirements, and from the Operator's perspective, we put forward some recommendations for automated testing process, frameworks, um, open source, and SDUs, etc., cetera, um, which are very worthy for the whole industry. And at the same time, we have also sorted out and summarized the current research status of automated testing technology in open source and also SDOs. And we also give our evaluation model for automated testing. So by refer to the evaluation model and automated testing technology, you can try to find some potential automated testing methods suitable for your company. Um, as you know that CSP has done many attempts in automated testing. Um, we hope that through the white paper, we can express operators' requirements, um, put forward um, industry development suggestions, um, share advanced technologies, then um, work with whole industry to promote the development of NFV testing in a more automated and intelligent way. And, and uh, I, I want to say that there's a question that came in that I think gets to the heart of it, which is how much of the testing framework is in fact automated today? Um, and, and of course, you know, manual testing, of course, you know, translates into significant resource drains and, and slows down the <clears throat> development process. So, you know, um, what were the findings, um, you know, about how much testing is in fact automated today and, and how, much, how much can open source really help with, with making that a reality? So, Randy? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, as I found a lot of the piece parts were there and there were some test orchestration tools there, but there were definitely gaps. I think most, a lot of the gaps were really at the application layer. For doing that, we've done a decent job at covering the infrastructure, though, of course, there's always, you know, more that can be done with, you know, how do you standardize the test? How do you test across multiple configurations and things like that? So, you know, I think we're still, you know, we're not, you know, we have a foundation, we have a starting point, but we're by no means, you know, almost done, right? There's still a lot of work to do in the space. Um, well, and, and how does containers really um, come into play? I mean, traditionally the telcos have been doing a lot of their testing. I mean, you know, it's not a, it's not a secret that OpenStack is, is pretty close to the default infrastructure mm -hmm. for, for telcos and, and as, as containers come in, you know, how's that, how's that, um, you know, how are we, are we ready? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think containers actually provide a lot of great opportunities for this space. Um, we're seeing in the cable market, actually a lot of Kubernetes on bare metal for our um, virtual CMTSs, our cable modem termination systems. And with Kubernetes, you can actually you know, deploy tests within the network very easily. You can do rolling upgrades um, with, you know, con container orchestration. You actually have a little more control over, you know, what version you're running, how you can load balance and manage failover. So with that part, it makes it a little easier. The part that can make it a little more challenging is you do have the same kernel and often the same scheduler. Um, and we've run into situations where you know, if you're running something like a VRAN and a virtual CMTS on the same physical server, they both have different scheduling requirements at the kernel level. And how do you test that and validate that and, you know, look at those trade-offs for performance there? And that's something that, you know, again, we're, as we get through these and we run more and more of these scenarios, we, we then develop these automated tests to capture that in the next time. And a lot of this is going to come down to, you know, the more real-world deployments we have, you know, one of the other questions is asking how real is NFE? And it's very real, right? There's a lot deployed today and looking at 5G and um, for cable and you know, future um, upgrades to the cable plant, um, they're all heavily reliant on virtualization. And most of the new applications are container-based. So, you know, yeah. 
Um, but I think that that, you know, probably is cr very critical going forward and a lot more so um, probably in the next, you know, two to five years than VMs will be. Well, I want to actually, I want to touch on that because uh, what I have found is I think you're, you're absolutely right. There's a mix right now. Um, I'd say containers are further along in the 5G space um, and because that's greenfield. Um, what I have found, you know, is that um, brownfield areas, you know, routing, networking, you know, the sort of basic networking functions are still VM based and in some cases still physical based. And, and I think that the industry is struggling to, to you know, get to be containerized. I mean, that's the North Star for everybody, <laughs> but we need to get there. And, I, and I'm hoping, I, I, I am planning on testing, helping to get there faster. Uh, Lee, would you like to comment on that? <laughs> um, I think I, I don't have no more comments. <laughs> okay. Um, Randy? I'd just say one other thing kind of along that continuum, as you mentioned, Beth, you know, OpenStack is kind of, has a lot of adoption in the telco space today. And then we're seeing, you know, things like Kubernetes deployed on OpenStack, where then OpenStack manages that Kubernetes environment. Yes. And then we're also seeing the evolution of the other side, where with technologies like Kubevert, where once you get to a tipping point, you can have Kubernetes manage your bare metal infrastructure and actually have VMs that are managed within Kubernetes, um, right. which is again, another interesting thing as we progress towards hopefully all container-based and cloud native, just, you know, just one of those things, the less infrastructure technologies you have to bring into bring to play, the easier it is to manage. Right. and test, less permutations there. So, so I wanna talk a little bit about what are the next steps? And, and I know Randy, um, the, you know, what do we need to move the test suites forward? You know, what, what, what is required? And, and uh, you know, there's a slide here about uh, some of the, uh, the work that's being done around ONAP. And uh, I know Randy, I think you were gonna talk yep. more about it. Yeah, this is great. Again, this shows how we are progressing as the industry, especially in some of the LFN projects. Um, you know, as you look at, right, you know, one of the key things to do for testing is you actually have to design your tests and plan them out and configure your network. So with, you know, ONAP, SDN, SDC, you can build a Tosca-based topology that can then be used repeatedly to run the tests. And then using an orchestrator like ONAP, you can actually deploy it. You can deploy many different variations of that same container. So you can test or same CNF or VNF and actually be able to test that repeatedly. And then of course, once you have that, that deployed, then you have you know, these virtual test plans where you can actually run scripts against it and collect results. You know, what is the performance? Is there failover? How does it handle failover? Um, you know, there's quite a few kind of test cases there and that's where you know, a lot of that just comes from real world experience, you know, oh, we ran into this problem, let's make sure we test against it next time in our regression suite. And then finally, you know, as we're talking about, you know, iterating through a wide variety of VNFs and CNFs across a variety of infrastructure options with kind of multiple deployment scenarios with, you know, different connections, networking types and overlay networks, you really need to have a good way to validate that. Um, and this is one of those things, like as these test suites mature, we're able to give a certification. And those certifications really show that you've been through this, not only that your application is mature enough, but that space is mature enough that there actually is a certification. Um, so you kind of need both, both prongs there to get that certification. And then the analysis, because you're going to have volumes of data and you're going to run these, you know, some of these tests you may run every five minutes, you know, every time there's a code check-in, you're going to kick off a pipeline that's going to run unit tests and do some deployment tests within a staging environment. So you just really need um, analytics to help interpret the test results. I mean, there's always going to be that human factor, but you know, more and more we want to have something that will say, you know, big red X, stop, and you can find that problem as soon as it was introduced, which really makes it easy to debug if there's only one change you're looking at as opposed to a few thousand changes. That's true. And, and, I, and I have found, um, you know, testing, uh, 
you know, testing in real life um, environments is very important because the network behavior of a real network and a network behavior of a lab network, um, I have found have kind of had nothing to do with each other. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important to have a lab that, that, uh, that reflects the, the real behavior on the network. <clears throat> and that's great, Beth. And how can we do that? Be, let me take your spot for a second. You know, what do you think we could do to help have, you know, open source communities out there have a better representation of what's actually running on the service provider network? So that's a that's a really interesting uh, interesting thing. Of course, you know, within within our environment, we we tap into our real network, which is how we do it. Um, so you know, our 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 lab is you know some of our labs actually tie into the actual network. So we do the testing on the actual network. But um, I think that's something that the open source community should should and should explore with the with the providers to gain. Um, you know, at least access to the, the internet <laughs> part of, of our real networks um, to, to really get a sense of, of how things actually perform. Um, and, it, and of course, it's very important that, you know, this is integration testing um, and end-to-end uh, -end testing and performance testing and all of those tests need to, need to take place. And um, I know Anakit's working on a badging system and, you know, a lot of the telco operators want performance testing, yet, you know, many of the vendors are relu reluctant to, to provide that for, you know, it's not that we can't, it's not that we don't do those performance tests, we have to, um, but we tend to do them internally in silos. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's something that the open source community does need to confront. And, um, and, and Lee, I know, um, uh, oh, that's a good question. So apparently we have a question about lean NFV, which uh, Lee or Randy, I'm throwing it out to you. <laughs> or, or Lee, want to talk about lean NFV? Uh, I, I can read it out. Um, Let's see, what approach would you recommend for addressing the data plane performance limitations, especially the networking between containers? Yeah, so, yeah, so I can look at, I'm happy to talk about that question. You know, with the, you know, addressing data plane performance limitations, this is where hardware acceleration comes into play. I think you'd be, you know, you know I don't think you'll find any um, solid functions out there that don't take advantage of something like DBDK to offload some of the networking functions onto smart NICs. Um, we're seeing crypto offload either on a smart NIC or through a separate FPGA. Um, in the VRAN, we're actually seeing quite a bit of FPGA um, utilization for the upper L1. So to do things like forward error correction um, and you know, fast Fourier transforms and all, the, all those fun, fun functions there. So I think that really um, that's something that, you know, Hardware acceleration is needed for some of that. And the other is looking at making sure you understand the topology of your network, both within the computer and where it sits uh, on other computers. Um, you know, especially with Kubernetes, you can do pipelining. So you actually can have, you know, CNFs talk to each other without going on to the network. So you can actually pipeline multiple containers together on the same NUMA nodes or the same processor um, on a system. And you also need to make sure that your processors are tied to the NIC that they're using. Otherwise, you'll have a performance hit there. So I said there's quite a few things out there today to do that. And um, yeah, we're, we're really looking a lot at how can we use some of this general purpose hardware acceleration to improve that, you know, to do a lot of these fairly common functions, not just put everything on the CPU. So, Lee, I'd like to... Um you know, get back to you. I know um, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the testing tools uh, that are available today, if you. Um, yeah. Yes. As I know that um, the current open source communities have conducted conducted research and um, exploration of automated testing tools and frameworks um, um, in the, in the 
NFE testing white paper. Uh, we have listed uh, current advanced automated testing tools for several mainstream open source communities and uh, standard organizations. And we have conducted technical analysis and rate research. Um, you can read the white paper to um, learn about the automated testing technologies that operators are concerned about. And it, which includes some advanced testing tools, automated testing frameworks, and interface um, standard requirements, et cetera. Um, as you can see on this page, uh, we take the current testing tool of uh, Elephant as an example, and we give um, technical analysis, um, including uh, VTP and X testing. Um, among which uh, you can see the um, the different description in these testing tools. Um, as you can see, that uh, VTP is a vertical com common test from, from platform for various VNF tests, and uh, which can be used in different test stages, um, including um, CI/CD. Uh, and Elephant OVP certification testing, uploading, design, and active and passive testing. Um, this platform provides um, execution verification function of test cases. And, uh, and as you can see from this page, uh, we have another testing tools as an example, uh, which called X testing. Uh, the X, X testing was originally proposed by uh, Funk test to achieve smoke and integration testing. And now it is mostly used to build CI CD tool chains. And I have also a C one question from the chat window um, asking about the, um, the the OVP certification, which um, is relevant to the um, VTP um, testing tools. Uh, uh, which the 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 um, project is OVP. Uh, the uh, the question is: Are there any OVP certifications for v VNFs recently? Um, indeed, as far as I know, that um, the OVP projects is now still under planning, and they have um, yes, they, they do VNF certification right now, and they have also considered try to um, extend their landscape to. Um, the AI and intelligent network um, certification in next step in OVP uh, 3.0, as far as I know. And that is my answer to this question. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, so let's, um, let's see. Oh. Uh, so one of the, uh, so as we sort of um, wrap it up, and I know we'll, we'll be answering some questions following up, you know, um, I just want to take a moment to say, please read the white papers. There's two. Um, one of them is the, just the recommendations and sort of high level uh, highlights. That's the one to share with your CIO. Um, and the second one really goes into the design methodologies and the requirements um, details and also a survey of uh, the test tools that are out there today, um, both uh, some proprietary ones as well as the open source ones that are available. Um, and I'd like to, you know, one final question to the panel. Um, you know, now that we've completed this this test testing and automation white paper, you know, what are our next steps for for taking taking what we learned here into our next, um, next project, which um, is focused on AI ML and how that will affect the, the uh, networks and you know, um, telco networks. I know there's a lot of interest right now in um, using AI ML, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning technologies um, and bringing them into our networks to really allow the networks to work more efficiently. Um, that's the promise, anyhow. And um, you know, just a, a little teaser about uh, some of um, you know where we're going with that over the next couple months. Uh, Lee, you want to talk a little bit about uh, our initial, you know, where we're going with this? 
<laughs> yeah, thank you, Beth. That is a good question. Um, indeed, as you know, that uh, the the artificial intelligence and network intelli uh, intelligence uh, are the development direction of the industry. So that um, we, we would like to uh, bring up a more automated and intelligent uh, testing process so that um, we would like to introduce um, the, the um, intelligent networking and artificial intelligence certification in this landscape. And uh, um, uh, besides, uh, we will, um, in next step, we will continue to focus on operators' automated testing requirements and um, give our recommendations to industry. Um, and we, we will continue to use the industry power to promote the development of automated and um, intelligent, um, agile NFE testing. Um, and uh, um, in terms of the, um, as Bess has mentioned, the artificial, uh, our AI and intelligent network, uh, we plan to collect operators network intelligent evaluation and um, testing requirements, and we plan to input them into relevant open source communities as a reference, um, as well as uh, industry driving force. Uh, as you know that um, the OVP 3.0, they have um, planned the, the um, AI certification uh, in their project so that uh, we will try to um, um, collect the requirements and work with them to bring these um, AI um, testing requirements and certification requirements into uh, realization. Thank you. And, and um, what uh, just in the cursory um, uh, review of the survey so far, <clears throat> I think that the, the sense in the community is we've really just started down this journey and we have a lot, a lot more to go. So I'm pretty excited about that. And, and the you know, operators are obviously gonna pay, play a major role in this. We're the ones with the data lakes. We're the ones with the information. And of course the, the vendors in the ecosystem also play a, a role as well. So that's, uh, I think, think it will, we're gonna be uh, very interesting uh, work over the next few months. Um, with that, um, we are going to, um, uh, take questions. I know we have a couple questions already in the queue. Um, so one of the questions is, um, has NFE really taken off since um, the first uh, ETS, um, um, ETSI white paper that was done six years back? Um, and uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about lean NF, <laughs> NFV? So either um, I, I can, I can answer from, uh, I think lean NFV is, uh, still an interesting concept. Um, I'm not sure, um, that it's, uh, hundred percent there yet, but, uh, I think, I think it needs to be a collaboration between the operators and the vendors to, to get there. Um, you know, I still see many, um, you know, I know we talked about 5G as being, you know, containerized and, and, you know, again, it was a greenfield situation, um, but I see most, uh, most of the other basic network functions have not been um, cloud nativeized, if you will. So open it to others for comment. Yeah, I think it's an interesting concept. I haven't seen a lot of it in real world deployments yet um, for lean NFE, but for NFE itself, um, I think it's kind of becoming the future and the de facto standard. You know, we're not necessarily going out and ripping legacy infrastructure that's still meeting the needs. And, you know, a lot of that held up through COVID. Um, but as we deploy new services and new functions and add capacity, um, you know, NFE and, v and CNFs um, are becoming more and more the, the default answer. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so Lee, I would, um, I'd like you to um, answer this one. Can we have a framework for NFE plus VNF plus CNF testing? <laughs> is, that, is that a worthy goal? Uh, yes, it is a potential goal. <laughs> we have do many attempts in different testing framework. And we, we, we wish to have this kind of framework for automated testing. <laughs> So it's it's a goal. <laughs> yes. Let's let's put it that way. Um, and I think we already answered the question about the testing framework being automated. Um, so I would say that that was answered. Uh, um, so um, Randy, maybe you can uh, talk about um, there's um, there's diverse data models and um, they vary quite a bit. And uh, you know how much does that, that does that break the the concept of automated um, and open source common testing frameworks? Um, yeah. Did that come up, you know, during our analysis? And I think it did. Yeah, it did. You know, because the more standardized the APIs are for both um, invoking tests and collecting results and parsing results, the more effective it is. Um, you know, with kind of in order to support all those diverse data models, you need a translation layer that will go through and normalize all the data, or perhaps something will come out of this AI ML working group that will make that um, a little more automated and less manually intensive. But yeah, really you know, relying on standards, either de facto or de jure standards for reporting information is, is key, right? You know, the, the easier it is to, you know, if we're all talking the same, structural language for the data and parsing it and for invoking the processes. It just makes it much easier to, to have a pipeline to handle everything. Yes, I think that's a good, good, uh, a good analysis. Lee, I'd like, um, uh, if you could talk about, um, you know, uh, I think you're familiar with the fact that, that a lot of the vendors provide their own testing um, frameworks and, and they're proprietary. Um, and each one is a little bit different, of course. Um, so how do you think that the open source community can address that to provide you know, a, a more a holistic uh, framework that, that can be used across multiple vendors? Um, uh, yes, that is the role of the EOAG, that the, the CSPs um, can lead this trend so that we, we can try to um, um, this list train to let them build this kind of common, um, what we call them common testing, automated testing framework. And that is what we attempt to do. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. I would agree with you. Um, and there's uh, a, uh, one additional question. I think we have time for one more and then, then we have a closing thing. Um, so Randy, this, um, what do you think is the next step in x86 hardware? Um, yeah. You know, particularly as we're <laughs> as we're moving toward um, you know DBDK and and some and then we're moving into the Intel SRIOV and and other and FPGA, which is you know getting back into the proprietary. Uh, you know, I think we've swung back and forth <laughs> a little bit. So, yeah, that's a great question. So we're we at Cable Labs is one of the places where we're actually spending a lot of time um, looking at this and how we can use Kubernetes to manage. Um, a lot of these different types of compute, you know, with x86 and other processor types, we do see fairly substantial improvements. I've seen claims of some of the newer generation CPUs having a 30% increased throughput per core at lower power usage. So, you know, that'll continue to progress. But for certain types of, of processing, you need something that's more standard. And, you know, as Beth mentioned, right now, writing to FPGAs is fairly proprietary, not even just to the vendor, but to the card type. Um, there's some promise with things like OpenCL and some more intelligent design tools that will let you write more portable design code. Um, P4 is something we're looking at where you can actually um, program some network functions either on switches or on NICs or on FPGAs or in, using the kernel space. So, you know, we try to look at some of these um, abstracted languages. It's, you know, it doesn't give us the performance as if we wrote it natively for that device, 
but it does allow us to take advantage of that hardware offload and can give us either better performance or at least better power consumption and higher density um, with using a lot of those technologies. So there really is you know, quite a bit available out there and I expect to see that growing and also more standardization in that area to make it you know, more portable to write code and have it run across a variety of acceleration types. Well, I also wanna mention that the OVP um, group is being renamed and is to and and it will um, be changed to to conform with the Anikit project. Um, so the Anikit project, which of course is focused on the infrastructure to support NFVs, um, is um, you know has has created a whole set of test cases. There's a lot of requirements documents. I mean, we have hundreds of pages of requirements documents. We do have the test framework, which is came from the uh, OPNFV project. Um, and uh, so um, interested parties should stay tuned. <laughs> um, with that, we have one more question and then I think we will have to wrap. Um, so the last question is, are there any commercial NFE testing labs available for certifying our VNFs? The community labs are more for testing tools development. I'm not sure I would agree with that, but um, that's what the person wrote. Uh, instead of commercial VNF testing, please let us know if there are any NFE testing labs for certification. So um, either Lee or Randy. Hello. Yeah, I, I haven't worked with them yet. We've been looking at how can we standardize this process and do some of the stuff at Cable Labs for the cable industry, but um, I don't really have a good answer to that question, unfortunately. I know, Beth, do you? I, I don't on? either, actually, because, um, you know, there are a number of labs, you know, the Lincoln's uh, UNH lab, and uh, I think Intel runs a lab, and there's a couple others out there that, that are really focused. I wouldn't say they're on tools development, though. I would say that, you know, the whole purpose of Anikit and badging is, in fact, to allow um, vendors to come in and get a badge that says that it meets the requirements, you know, that it, that it, that it passed the test to say that it, that it will fit in a stand, you know, it will, it, it meets the requirements of being, um, able to be a reference, you know, map to the reference, uh, architecture, the reference, um, implementations. Lee, you want to comment on that? Yes, I fully agree with both of your opinions. Um, I think that there are many of the commercial NFE testing labs here, and uh, you can choose which is um, mostly fit for you. And it is a little hard for us to to answer um, uh, which is good or which is. Um, not so good. Maybe you can try to use some evaluation method. Um, indeed, in the white paper, we have this is the um, evaluation model for reference. And uh, um, from the um, testing objects, uh, the, 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 the um, labor division, the testing process, etc. Uh, maybe you can try to um, rate this content for reference and find a, a suitable way for 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 your testing um, testing object. So with that, I think um, uh, we've come to the end of our our webinar. I thank you, Randy and Lee, for a very interesting and. Uh, discussion and with some great questions. And I encourage everybody, everybody to download and read the two white papers. Uh, I think you'll find a lot of um, thoughtful reading and, and, and some really interesting insights. Yeah, thanks Beth for helping facilitate this. And it's been great. And as you say, we ended up with two papers instead of one, just because we had so much that we wanted to talk about in this area. And it's something that the end user group was very excited and passionate about. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for your effort in these white papers.
And thanks to all of our panelists and all of our attendees, and we'll see you all on another upcoming Elf Networking webinar.